uh, 5 o'clock. Call to order the Committee of the Whole Agenda meeting on October 10th, 2022. Uh, under appearances, it looks like first up, I have Josie Olson with MnDOT, Project Manager, District 1, and Tim Florine. Is that correct? HR Green uh, regarding the Highway 61 project as well. Good afternoon. Uh, is this on? Turn it on, please. Oh. Yeah, Jesse, are you on? Okay. Good. Uh, good afternoon, Council uh, uh, members. Uh, well, pleasure to be here. Uh, Josie will be stepping up here in a moment here. I'm, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm Tim Thurian with HR Green. I'm the consultant project manager for the Two Harbors project, uh, the Tire 61 project here in Two Harbors. Uh, I'm going to go through briefly, I think, uh, uh, we'll get on the screen here the presentation that, it, that we walked through at the open house uh, on September 27th. I might go through it kind of quickly because I know time is tight. Um, so if you want to stop at any moment, please feel free to do that or we can get through the presentation. I think it'll take maybe 15, 20 minutes. And then we'll have time for Josie to come up and, and talk to you about some next steps. And then if there are specific things you want to get back to in, in, in the details of the deep design or the, the recommendations, happy to do that. So uh, I'll just jump right in. Uh, go ahead, Joe. Uh, so you can see with the, the project corridor limits are roughly from Scenic Drive, a little bit west actually, or closer to the railroad crossing uh, at, at west of Scenic Drive, uh, to just east of, of Park Road. Uh, we've been doing the study for now over a year and uh, built off of actually a lot of the great work that was done in the city beforehand with the vision study for the Ivy Quarter. So that was a really great starting point. Uh, we had, a, a, up, up to this open house that we had uh, last month, we had uh, two previous public meetings uh, with, the, with the city here, sharing our thoughts and getting feedback from people. And here's just a, a quick summary of, of some of the things that we use, methods we use. We had an online interactive map. We have a website. You're welcome to go visit that any time, of course. And, and a variety of uh, direct uh, engagements with the community to get feedback about the project. Uh, go ahead, Joel. Uh, these just points to some of the key issues that people brought up through those surveys. Safety came up uh, as important, uh, traffic and congestion, of, of course, naturally. And, and what we got out of those, the, what, what was important what we got out of that feedback was those formed the basis for our evaluation criteria. So we tried to establish those evaluation criteria before we even develop alternatives. Uh, as, so then at the second public meeting, we, we shared public, uh, alternatives with, with the public. At that meeting, we had uh, about seven or eight uh, concepts that we would share with the public, wanted to get some feedback. And we also had a number of alternatives that we didn't share more formally, but we also had available for discussion. And part of what I want to make sure that, this, that everybody's aware of it, when we went through the alternatives process, we considered a wide range. Sometimes some, you might see these alternatives and kind of feel a little bit underwhelmed <laughs> by this the magnitude of the changes. Um, but actually, I think there are significant changes that we'll, we'll talk about. But we did briefly think about bigger impact kind of uh, uh, solution, uh, solutions as well, and just determined that those were not appropriate for this, this full scale of the project and the objectives. Uh, so we did consider bigger uh, impact things, but thought that would be too much of an impact to the community to, to go ahead with those. Uh, so what we did here, uh, the positive from the community, uh, a lot of positive uh, feedback about the continuous left turn lane uh, instead of basically instead of having a median down through the, the middle of Highway 61. Uh, positive feedback about roundabouts. Uh, some businesses were not so we did preserve propose or look at roundabouts right on this like that sixth uh, where it's pretty tight would have been like a mini roundabout and that was not very well received. But in other places where we looked at our bonds, where they're more appropriately fit, that there, we, we did get positive feedback. Uh, and then, of course, maintaining those signalized intersections where we, we have those in place, like 6th and 7th in particular, 4th, uh, uh, as another uh, lot of feedback, positive on those. Um, again, can, the center median was not very well received. Uh, limit reductions in access to, 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 uh, to businesses or, or, or you know, any kind of Limitations maybe thought by median or, or left turn loss was not so favorably received. And then we, we did look at one way streets, both uh, in a pair, one way pair where you would be going east west uh, using 7th Street or 7th or, uh, or Avenue, 61, and 6th Avenue as a one way pair kind of concept. 
And then alternatively, another concept that was north to south, the streets, 6th and 7th streets, the one way is. And those were, had some intrigue to them, uh, but uh, did not uh, have enough uh, favorability to it. Uh, so there's some, there's some key features then about the, the, the recommended alternative. Uh, we have that consistent three-lane uh, cross-section, one through lane, one center left turn lane. Uh, we do have roundabouts, and, and the, I think one of the maybe uh, unsung aspects of the project is the multimodal improvements that we'll see. We've got some really great improvements for trails and sidewalks and, and access through the corridor. And uh, some, some uh, uh, concessions need to be made that, and where things are really tight, but I think overall we're adding a lot of great benefits to the multimodal network. So what I'll do here is walk through the corridor. Uh, we've got kind of five segments that will be we are shared with the public that kind of walk. So it'll be west through east, walk through the corridor. And I'll just touch on the high points and uh, uh, certainly open to questions or, or maybe things that come up, uh, just raise your hand and have you to speak to them directly. So this, this western segment here is the, the very west part, kind of centered around the St. Drive. And, and it's, so the details are not going to be visible to you, so uh, bear with me. I'll try to, distrib, to, to, to uh, describe them uh, adequately. You know. But the, the key features here, uh, west of Sand Drive, you're going to see the addition of a cable barrier. Uh, uh, so that, that would be running right down the middle of the roadway. There's been issues with in the, in the past of run off the road or, or issues with safety there. So we're going to address that with the addition of a cable barrier uh, uh, device that will prevent crossover into the uh, opposing traffic. Uh, the other key feature here at, at Scenic Drive is that we're eliminating the left turn lane from Scenic Drive onto southbound Highway 61. Uh, uh, the, the crashes that we've seen at that location have been actually not specifically related to that left turn, but I think they are kind of related to it in a way because it's these right turns that are, that are happening that are more predominant. They get kind of clouded by that left turn and get some weird sight line dynamics happening when you have that like, left turn out there. And so cleaning up that, that, that intersection with this just the one right turn, uh, I think will provide a lot of value for safety and operations there. And knowing especially that you've got uh, reasonable options to go south on 61 further, further to the west on the safe drive. Uh, the other key ingredient here that you see and that you're starting to see now is a, a purple line that shows up on the south side of the lake side of Highway 61. That's the addition of a, a multi-user um, trail uh, that would be Essentially, a connection from, I call it the Culver's intersection, uh, uh, all the way over to Sand Drive. So, providing, providing a, a route for bicyclists in particular, but bike, could be a pedestrian, to get to Sand Drive safely and off of Highway 61. So, here's a typical segment. Here you can see a, a diagram that, that represents what that area with the cable barrier would look like. And then here's just a visualization. Uh, so here's the existing picture. And then if you go to the next one, you can see what it was intended to look like there with, with the elimination of that left turn lane and the addition of the cable barrier. And then here's the, the typical cross section between Scenic Drive and 7th Avenue with the, the three lane uh, continuous through, through there. That's really where we're starting to do that. And, and you'll experience that three lane that uh, configuration all the way through the rest of town. And now we've got the trail I did on the south uh, or the lake side of the road. And then we'll just, uh, move over to the 7th Avenue intersection there, Culver's and, and Holiday. Um, go ahead, Joe. And here you can see we are in the roundabout at that location. Um, uh, it just, just operates better long term, provides a lot of safety benefits, and uh, seems to fit in really nicely with that, that uh, environment. The space that's available for it is, is really. Um, Workable for that. We're also at, at the same time we're doing that roundabout. We're going to change the profile of the road a little bit just to try to improve some of the sight lines, the dynamics there. If you're familiar with that area, if you're coming out of holiday, you're getting out of that stoplight, you add a little bit of an incline. I don't think we're going to totally correct that, <laughs> but I think there will be an opportunity to, to correct it a little bit so it's not quite so steep in the winter time. You know, there's concerns about ice and, and challenges just kind of sitting there waiting for your turn. So hopefully that'll get corrected. Then the roundabout should just generally move better anyway. So you guys generally you should be more mobile through the intersection. I think that'll provide a, a benefit as well. And then here's, here's a rendering of that uh, the, that uh, the location. 
existing conditions and then the future proposed. So the runway, I think, really fits in there nicely. There's plenty of space for it to fit in there. And you're getting a lot of safety benefits there for pedestrian and, and uh, bicyclists um, moving through the corridor as well. And also, you can see if, if the city so chooses for the long term to extend that, that roadway, the intent you know, is still available there with that about that as well. And this is where the sidewalk starts to come in on the north side. Correct. Yeah, uh, yes. So uh, you'll see that on the next page, but yeah, what, we'll get into the you know, slide on to the next, like, next segment there, Charles, so a good segue. Um, where we get into uh, that area then um, uh, east of, of the new roundabout at the Sun Avenue, we're going to be adding not only improving the sidewalk on the I call it the cemetery side of the road, uh, that's going to go from a six foot to probably about a ten foot road uh, sideway sidewalk or trail, uh, but then also on the north side of the road, currently it's a ditch basically, and uh, that ditch will be filled, replaced with with pipe uh, conveyance of, of stormwater, and you'll have a new sidewalk on the north side of, of the road, so a nice six foot sidewalk on the north side, providing access yeah, to the businesses there. Right, we'll go to 11th Street uh, intersection, the, the quick trip intersection, we call it sometimes. And it, here again, uh, here's the second of two roundabouts that we're proposing to add into the corridor. Uh, and you can see the purple lines there, so we're continuing that, that pedest the pedestrian benefits on the both the north and south side of Highway 61 through this area. Uh, we're adding uh, uh, connections up to the, the Credit Union that's on the north, side, the north leg there of that intersection, so there's no no pedestrian access or no sidewalk on that side of uh, 11th Street right now. But that would be added into the mix. And one of the things that's still uh, is in re in process for getting refined a bit, but the intent is what we're trying to really express here is is that we're moving that leg, that south leg of the intersection, off of the foot trip entrance, <laughs> and so we're trying to get it positioned more to the west of that so that you've got an opportunity for for a longer term improvements. So you're not kind of relegated to just having it be a quick trip access. Um, and so we do recognize that this, the way it's presented right here on the screen image is probably not really the way it'll end up being totally because we've got to figure out how to get trucks through there. And, and the way it's drawn right now is probably not really going to work. But the intent there is what we're trying to convey with this right now, that we're, we're trying to provide access Clean up some of the McDonald's access to it and, and try to get people into the wrong block and, and, act, and get into those proper uh, left or right turn like that to uh, Highway 61. And so here's a, another rendering of the existing picture of that location. And then the next one, uh, again, the wrong block. This one, we're going to be pushing, the, the, that pushes the impact a little bit north. And so if you, there's currently wetlands in Skunk Creek area. Uh, it does create some impacts in that, that area. Um, I think it's I think it's reasonable for what the benefits are going to provide. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go to the next segment between Ninth and, and Fifth or Ninth and uh, yeah, Ninth and Fifth Street here. Um, again, continuing with that three-lane cross-section all the way through. So what that means, what the implication is that right now, if you're familiar, if you're familiar with it, the, the roadway. It does this kind of chicane, it's like an hourglass kind of in and out type of a thing. But what will be different now is that you'll have straight through lanes all the way. So you, when you get in there, your northbound lane, you're going to be straight, you're going to see that plane all the way through the town. Likewise, coming southbound. The impact of that, the effect of that though, is that when you do that, we have to limit parking on one side of the roadway. And we've chosen based on the feedback that we got from the public and some of our traffic modeling, we think that it's more appropriate to limit the parking on the north side of Highway 61. So in other words, the southbound 61 side, we're, we're, we're proposing to remove parking on that side and only have parking on the south side of, of the highway. In the scheme of things, if we, we did it kind of just a, a, a square footage count. We anticipate that you'd be losing about 30% of your, of your total parking capacity. And so in other words, you're not losing 50%. You know, we're, we're taking parking off of one side of the road, but in the, you know, when, it, when it's all designed out and, and, and built, you effectively only lose about a third of the parking capacity that, that's there currently. I have a question on that one. Is there any um, plans by mid-next year to have the sidewalk to replace those parking spots with off-street parking on the north side? Not, not currently. Uh, no. We have not discussed that at all. I know that the vision document for instance identified locations on six. A couple of locations yeah. that we thought would be yeah. um, 
opportunities to have that parking, of course, they would just they wouldn't be able to. I mean, if they're on the north side, they'd have to go south, not try to cross three lanes of traffic. Yeah. But um, that I was just curious if that had been looked at. We uh, we were aware of it of that of that concern about parking on the north side or, or off street parking, but we haven't done anything to develop that or progress that. And I'm not. Josie's probably a better person to speak to some of the property owner. She will be come up here next. Okay, I'll that. hold that question for Josie. Yeah. Then. One other one other note here is that we did pay attention to the Eighth Street. There was the concern about safe routes to school, and at Eighth Street in particular, you can't see it very well here, but we we are adding a little bit of a bump out. Uh, at that on the west leg of 8th Street at intersection, so that we've got a shortened uh, crossing distance for, for pedestrians to get across uh, from the north to the south side and uh, basically on the way to the elementary school to the south. Okay, we'll go to the next. So here's just a representation of, of, of what we're talking about there. Again, just continuous through lanes and parking on the south side of Highway 61. And one note we are going down to 11 foot lanes, so we, we, have, we currently have 12 foot lanes through town. We are proposing to shift to 11 foot lane with the anticipation that will help to calm speeds and, and it provides you know, available space. Two feet means a lot <laughs> in the scheme of things when you're looking at other pedestrian improvements and an opportunities in the corridor. And here's a, here's a rendering of that like, corridor here. How does that third lane that you're going to put through from? McDonald's side of the underpass to overpass to that. How does that going to impact that bridge? It does not. It does not affect the bridge. There's enough space for it. One other thing you know here is on the south side, your pedestrian shrinks from that 10 foot trail. Correct. So on the cemetery side, I'll call the cemetery side of the things. We're at a 10 foot trail, multi trail. And it's the side of the things that we're at a 10 foot trail, multi -trail. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then when we get into this segment, we're just doing traditional six foot sidewalk uh, through Judson. When you say trail, are you thinking asphalt or concrete? Uh, I don't know if the details have been worked out with that specifically. Uh, I would imagine that. I don't know. I, I won't even speculate. Okay. Um, that, that's something that probably could be worked out between the, the, the city and the uh, um, for that. Because there are ongoing maintenance issues that you're probably thinking exactly. about. Exactly. Um, uh, so, so it does neck down, and then the consequence of that is that we're not entirely sure about uh, bicyclists. So we, we are aware of bicyclists but would love to be able to just be right on Highway 61 all the way through town. And we don't think that's realistic to provide, you know, that we, we don't think that there's space in the cross section at, at this location to provide a 10 foot trail through there. We just don't have that space. Um, sure, bike, bikers could use the six foot sidewalk. That would be an option for them right now. But we also think that, and I know that the city is spoken to the potential for long-term cultivating a, a connection to the 6th uh, Avenue corridor for a bike trail. So that's what we've represented. Joel, maybe if you go back a few slides. Yeah, right there. Um, you, can, you can see it, a dashed line that's kind of is uh, showing on there, yeah. And so, so I think there's still things to be worked out with that. And, and Minna's essentially saying, here, this is what you've described, and it, it's kind of, and, Paul's near court kind of a thing. Um, but the intent would be trying to at least have some option for bicyclists to get to the 6th Avenue corridor. And, and so this is what we see as the most reasonable one available right now. Uh, so that would be going through that alley between 8th and, uh, and 9th, and then kind of getting down to 6th Avenue at 8th uh, to continue eastward towards uh, Burlington Bay. Okay. <coughs> And uh, the last segment here is uh, at Park Road or between 4th and, and Park Road. Uh, go for it, uh, so you hear, see here, we're not really fundamentally changing anything at 4th Street intersection. We keep retaining the signal there. Uh, the, the, the lane configuration changes a little bit now. But it's generally the same intersection. Uh, the big change here that's happening is east of there then. It's currently kind of what we call a, a rural section. So in other words, there's no curb and gutter. Uh, through that area. Now we're, we're proposing the addition of curb and gutter through there. Uh, what that does is it helps to tighten up the corridor and, and the footprint of that roadway and create some additional space for that trail. So you see now we, we bring back that trail on the south side and we're providing uh, essentially um, access to the future Gitche County Trail that is proposed uh, for, from DNR. And so it would be a nice connection from 4th Street 
uh, over towards the Burlington Bay a little bit above the visitor center or, or Park Road where Kitchen Emmy would be coming in. Um, well, a lot of the feedback that we got from the public, a lot of concern about the crossing desire or intent of uh, pedestrians want to cross a park at Park Road. It's just is a common parking or crossing spot. And you know, there's a trail that continues north of there. We looked at that and looked at that and tried to figure out a way to make that work. And I know that you know, the city has talked about uh, underpasses and, and that's been part of the DOT dialogue to date. And, and we're, uh, we can speak to that a little bit following this discussion if you'd like. Uh, but what we landed on is that the most a more appropriate option for pedestrian crossings is to provide, you can see, a, a pedestrian crossing refuge there at Bukata mid or mid block refuge between 4th and Park Road, essentially at the visitor center, where pedestrians have the opportunity to cross one lane of traffic at a time. So they'll cross, they'll get a chance to stop, turn, orient themselves to the next lane of traffic, and then cross over. And that, to me, to us, is more safe. It also has like a traffic calming benefit as well, so if people's coming in from the east, that's a really, I mean, we talk about scenic drive area, people coming in. People kind of naturally slow down because of the curve. Coming in from the east is another story. I think people really are kind of naturally inclined to come in pretty hot, <laughs> pretty fast. And, and I think what we get out of this, what we anticipate out of that, that pedestrian crossing is that there's a little bit more of a signal. Along with the curve, we've got more signals to the motorists that there's, hey, you come into an urban area, you need to slow it down. So we see that as a benefit. The other thing that's going to be beneficial at, at Park Road is that we're adding that, that left turn lane. So currently, right now, you might have a big rig of you know, a truck and trailer combo trying to make a left turn into the Burlington Bay campground area, and they're sitting there blocking the through lane as well. Now, with the three lane section, they're going to be able to be parked essentially waiting for that left turn in that left turn lane, and that won't hinder the through traffic. You know, so, that'd be another benefit. I uh, also want to speak to if we get a moment uh, uh, at that. Park Road, we are proposing to realign it slightly, and so this is something we do want to make sure we're in coordination with the city about and having some connections between DNR and the city and Mendana, because, because Burlington Bay Campground received grant funds uh, 30 years ago, or more, 40 years ago, almost, uh, that, that give it a special designation in, in their system that requires um, coordination with them any time they're proposing to convert some of their land. So we're proposing to convert some of the land by realigning Park Road so that it's more of a perpendicular crossing. That'll provide a lot of safety benefits to that location. Better sight lines, a lot of people looking over their, their shoulders for turns. We provide a lot of benefits. So there's a lot of valid reason for doing it. It also creates space potential for a trail connection on the east side of Park Road. You know, the city wants to see something happen down to Sanju Trail. This might actually help enable that, with the, especially with the Kitchen County coming in. So we see a lot of benefit to, to realignment of Park Road, but it does require then coordination and consultation with the DNR because of the status of Burlington Bay Campground. So we'll need to be working close with the city on that issue and demonstrating the value of it, essentially. Okay. And here's just the, the, the cross section as I described. Still to keep that three lane section, we have now an urban kind of cross section with curb and gutter. And we do actually, on the, for a short segment of the north side, we do have sidewalk as well. And here's the uh, rendering of the, here's the existing picture, and then the next one shows the so post change. Um, so, okay. I'll, I'll stop there, Josie. If you want to come up here, you can speak to kind of next steps and, and uh, ongoing community uh, work, engagement, and, and, and so forth. Okay. I'll be happy to answer your questions here after. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, thank you to the council for um, inviting us to, to come and talk to you about our project. Appreciate it. Um, next steps in the project timeline, it, it might seem like 2025 and 2026 are really far off, but they're, they're not when you're developing a pro project of this size. So what we'll continue to do um, this, this year into next year is the preliminary design where we're moving forward with what we call a geometric layout that shows the it shows where all of the accesses are, all of the roadway geometry, um, how the how the intersections um, are laid out, how the intersections are controlled. We'll bring that in the, in the spring to the city through what is called a municipal consent process, where we'll present 
the, the council with our geometric layout showing all of those, those um, project elements. And then we'll ask for a resolution of, uh, to be passed of approval. And um, that is scheduled to happen sometime in the spring. And then after we get um, that process completed, we'll move into our design plans for construction. That's final design, it'll go through 2024. And then we plan for construction in 2025 and 2026. Forward, Joel. And oh, that's my contact information. Um, and our project website is also there. You can find that the project website from our MnDOT District One website. I did want to um, address a couple of, of things, namely our uh, right of way land management process that that we've been going through. So um, one thing to note for the council to note is that early notification letters have been sent out to every business and uh, resident along 61 where we have the potential to um, acquire either permanent or temporary easements. So that letter just uh, tells them that we have a project coming, we may need to talk to them about utilizing their property, and gives our land management engineer the, uh, his contact information for questions. And that allows us to start talking to, to landowners and start gathering information. I do have a copy of a blank copy of that, that letter if anybody is interested in, in knowing exactly what that has in it. Um, we do have one, you, you noted the roundabout at 11th and uh, on the south side, there's a residence that um, next to Quick Trip that we have spoken to. We've, we've just going to ask that question. <laughs> we have reached out to them and had a, a, a meeting with them and, and talked with them a couple of times. Um, they are one possible relocation that we're looking at, and um, that process to relocate a, a a landowner relocate a house is is a long process. So I do also, I brought with me the, some pamphlets that we have that describe that whole process if anybody is interested in that as well, that we've provided to that landowner and um, it just describes what, what MnDOT will do and, and we take care of the landowner and throughout the entire process. Um, we, speaking of that roundabout location, there is the, the south leg of the roundabout into Quick Trip um, and McDonald's. The, we do need, yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a good good place. Um, it's depicting that the roundabout leg only extends a very short distance south of the actual roundabout. Um, that's how we're, we're depicting it in, in our exhibits. However, in discussions with, um, with the, the businesses adjacent to the, the roundabout, they would like to see um, connections that are go further south into their property. If we did have, have that um, scenario, we would need a commitment from the city to um, own maintain, to take ownership of that south leg of the roundabout. We would need a commitment from the city to do that. Um, and we can, we can talk about that further if there's questions about that. Um, let's see. The, the underpasses that were, were mentioned um, that I think Joe has, has presented to the council, um, Right now, what, what MnDOT has been, has been presented was a feasibility, uh, an exhibit showing the feasibility of snowmobile slash ATV underpasses, so used for motorized use. Motorized use is not something that MnDOT typically provides funding for, we can put it into our project that if, if the council decides to move forward with something like that and fund that, that 
it is not a problem to put something like that into our project. However, other funding sources will likely be needed if, if that element is put into our project. Now, um, like I said, we've been presented with the feasibility of snowmobile ATV underpasses. If those do change to a feasibility of you know, pedestrian bike facilities, that that's different. There's there's likely more um, ability for MnDOT to fund something like that. I'm not going to, you know, promise that we can fund the whole thing or anything like that. But um, MnDOT does have the ability to provide funding for those types of uses. Parking was, oh I'm sorry, parking was brought up. Um, off street, providing off street parking for the parking that we are eliminated, eliminating from the, uh, from the trunk highway. The, that would be a shared cost for if parking is, is found off of the trunk highway, MnDOT, our cost participation policy allows MnDOT to pay for some of the costs to replace parking that we take off of the trunk highway and put off, off the trunk highway. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know what those, I can't give you details tonight, I can provide that information if anybody is interested in that, but um, it, there would be, you know, the cost of, of acquiring the property, building a parking lot, um, and then maintenance, lighting, that sort of thing. It is all um, maintenance, getting it lit, that is, is, would be a city cost, but some of the other costs um, are allowed to be shared. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to bring up was um, a, having a, a requesting a council representative for our project. Um, our, we've been, our contact people are, you know, city engineers, city planner, um, but you know that those are not city um, employees. There's, there's nobody that is a decision maker. Um, Miranda has been part of our discussions, Patty's been part of our discussions, but I think what would be a nice um, add would be if we had somebody directly from the council as a representative to be in on some of our stakeholder meetings and just to help with that decision making process. So I'm, I, I think myself and Tim are available for specific questions if anybody has them. Uh, I just had one. There was some concern about the about the roundabouts. Um, you know, when we get really busy on the weekends, the north south, or I mean the the north south traffic this way, that it would just be a steady flow. Like sometimes we're backed up all the way to the tunnels. How would the roundabout help that? In the sense that it could be solid traffic coming. Um, so I'm not. I'm not against <laughs> roundabouts. I like them myself. But uh, I was just concerned about that. So. Um, Jim, would you mind coming? Our district traffic engineer is, um, we had him for here for these exact types of questions. If you would take a stab at that. Well, well I can give it a whirl. The, uh, really, the way the roundabouts work is that uh, if you're in the roundabout, you have, you have the right of way. So uh, even though you have a strong northbound or southbound or east-west, depending on your orientation here, there will be... Uh, vehicles on the, that are making lefts out of that that traffic, and that that causes uh, other traffic to yield, which kind of leaves gaps in the roundabout. So, although it might seem like when you get that consistent traffic that that's all that's going to it's just going to be zipping through, there's enough turning movements that will occur that create kind of these gaps where you're going to be able to move in and. and and get off the side street. So it's it's not terribly intuitive, but that's kind of our experience on how those roundabouts work when you have a, a significant amount of one-way, you know, single traffic going in one direction. 
Um, yeah, I'm going to do one of the first work. Um, I have a major concern about the wrong call for a quick trip there. I, I see tons and tons of pedestrian traffic there. I do see some sort of pedestrian crossing there, but that looks like it's going to kill somebody. Yeah, so, sorry. Well, I, I have no, actually, uh, roundabouts are, all the backup signals are actually where most of our uh, pedestrian <coughs> crashes take place. Uh, if you look at a, a city and where your pedestrian crashes take place, they take place at signals. Roundabouts are actually designed so that as you enter a roundabout, you, you are traveling generally no more than 20 miles per hour, and you're entering in a single lane. All these that we're proposing are single lane roundabouts, which means as a pedestrian, uh, partly geometrics. You, it's very clear that the pedestrian has, has a desire to cross, and they only have to cross one lane. So you cross one lane, and you're in the splitter island, and then you cross the next lane. And I'm like you. I don't. I I live in Lakeside in Duluth. And we don't have any roundabouts, right? So I haven't walked. I hadn't walked any roundabouts. And I know as a uh, agency, we've been proposing a number of roundabouts. And that very question came up about crossing roundabouts as a pedestrian. So I went and walked, I'd say, three, four, five roundabouts as a pedestrian. And the geometry is such that people stop for you. Uh, they really do. I, it might not seem like they would, but when you're, you're at that crosswalk and there's only a single lane, so basically you're going to cross, uh, it's a 12-foot lane plus some shoulders, you're going to cross maybe... 14, 16 feet of pavement versus at a signal you're crossing maybe 50 feet of pavement. People will stop for you. You're, you're right in front of them, and the, the crosswalk actually occurs before the yield signs, so uh, people are yielding for the pedestrian. So I can tell you from experience uh, that that uh, it, it doesn't seem like it would work, but it really does. And I, we have some video that we can share, and we don't have it reeled up here, but of pedestrians crossing at roundabouts and how that works. And I, I don't know if it'll make a believer of you, but I mean, you can actually see how how that does work as a pedestrian. Thank you for the answer, <clears throat> Robin. Um, as long as you're talking about um, traffic configurations, I found it very interesting the comments that you made about um, the, the 11 foot lanes making people slow down and traffic calming and then you know after this last weekend I'm like I don't know that that's what people really want because it seems like that's the big complaint is that it takes so long to get through two parties so are we really trying to calm the traffic? I know it's a tough question I mean, but I'm just curious because I mean it was really it was nuts this weekend. Well I can tell you yes when when traffic is busy, uh, it probably doesn't need calming because it's not traveling through two harbors at a very quick pace. Um, I guess generally speaking, when we're talking about calming traffic, we're try talking about uh, as people enter into two harbors, creating an environment where people don't feel like going 50. They feel very comfortable going more 30 or you know something more relatable to a, a city where people are walking. So. Um, I think what you'll find with this design is that it's calming, but it, it's going to promote a more uniform flow through town. The roundabouts will help with that on the west end, and the, the signals are what the signals are, right? I mean, we can only get so much traffic through on a green light, and eventually we're going to have to stop. And, and So when the signals are timed, we try to get the most people through, but acknowledge that we have side streets. So I'm not sure I answered your question. But I think that what we're talking about when we talk about traffic calming is kind of creating a uniform flow through town and creating that environment when it's not really busy that people are going to want to slow down all by themselves without speed limit sign, without anything else dictating the speed. And the other question that I had, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, I just was curious. Um, you said that you sent a letter out to, to the residents. Was there um, any... Um, shall I say, disgruntled business people or citizens that were having a hard time with the whole project? I, I haven't gotten any phone calls from as a result of that letter. Okay. Um, but just talking with folks over the last year, there are some that have the opinion that Things are fine just like they are, no changes are needed. Mm -hmm. um, 
that is not, by far not, the majority. The majority of people agree that things are not fine like they are, that there needs to be some improvements made, and what we've done over the last year is listen to <coughs> residents, listen to people who use Highway 61, hear what their concerns are, what they say needs to be improved, and this, <clears throat> this design answers those needs and those concerns. So as I'm looking at this picture of the 11th Street intersection, am I correct in saying that the, is there like um, a frontage road over to McDonald's and the hotel? Or is that the trail? That would be a frontage road. Yeah, well, yeah but that's a good word for frontage okay. road. It's just an access. An that, access yeah. over to those properties. Okay, yes. that makes me feel a little bit better then. That would be the area. Right. Can I ask one more, Mr. Chair? I know I'm sure. Okay. Um, and just because um, I know that he's here, and I'm not putting on the spot, Rick, you don't have anything to share, but I see that the Chief of Police is here, and I did have a conversation with Ken and just was wondering their thoughts and if they um, have any concerns or questions that should be shared now before we get further into the process. <clears throat> um, no, I don't have any. I've worked with Jim Miles before. And he's never steered me wrong before, so <laughs> maybe this is the first time, but um, the traffic flows and safety, uh, the safety piece of it is what I'm concerned about, and, and I'm sure MnDOT, that's their number one concern as well, in speaking with them, so no, no concerns. Okay, thank you, I, yep. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, go ahead. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Um, public load in on this at all? Uh, usually this is the time for just a council discussion, but if you have some short I just, question, go ahead. Just a quick one. Sure. Occasionally, it's not every day, occasionally you're going to have traffic that's heading east that's going to stop at the first stoplight and it's going to back solid. Have you? Is there studies or computer simulations for what happens, say at Quick Trip, when it's solid and stopped for a red light? at say 7th Avenue or 7th Street and maybe even stopped all the way out to the quick or to the uh, Culver's. Does anything, uh, you reach critical mass and something crazy happens if you ever plug that roundabout up? <laughs> well we have done simulations and that has not occurred but uh, Brent, yes there, there's uh, if you plug a roundabout up uh, it's, it's gridlock but no, we have not We've not experienced that in our simulations showing the, the peak weekend traffic uh, that, you know, we've, we've been looking at the worst of the worst and, and we're not going to make the, you know, after we're done with this project, it's not like it's, traffic's just going to flow through two harbors and you'll never see a backup again. That's just not the case. We only have a single lane in each direction. But we have not experienced that in our analysis and I don't anticipate that being an issue. Jim, you might want to say, how long did you model for and what was your proposal? You did a 20-year model. Yeah, yeah, we did a 20-year model, but I don't remember what our growth percent was. I do recall it being uh, we were we were conservative and expand, and it, our growth percent would be higher than what you would, or it's at or above what you would expect. The point is that you model future projections. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah, yes. We did model future volumes, not just today's volumes, but we were looking out into the future as to how this project would work, not just today, but we did model out 20 years. At the high school conference there, they said 25 to 40 percent increase over 20 years. That, that would be the same data, so yes, that, that would fall in line with it. <clears throat> Go ahead, Councilor Anderson. First, thank, thanks for saying the reality that we're not adding more lanes, we're not adding speed. I think there's been an expectation or maybe a perception that these things are going to make things go faster. So thank you for sharing that piece so that people recognize that this is not becoming an expressway. Um, so thank you for sharing that. My question is back on the west side um, where the scenic highway meets, I, I'm sorry, are we, did you say we're not going to allow people who are going southbound to turn left on that first expressway? Oh, oh no. So the, the, the important distinction there is that we're pro prohibiting the left turn from Scenic Drive on to Highway 61. You will be able to make the left turn on to Scenic Drive from, from town. 
Got it. Thank you. I I thought that's what, but then when I looked at the video, I'm like, oh, okay. So thank you for that clarification. And, and I, I should point out that, that, that what this imp the implication is for the intersection is that if there was to be access on the north side, I, I don't know. I, I, see, I drive by, so I can't. I, I see stuff happening there. Right. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there, but. Um, this would have some implications for, for moving through there, and what happened would require some more coordination with MnDOT about what is necessary for access on that north side of Highway 61. We are we are proceeding as though that that there's nothing happening there right now, and so that right turn only is what you got. Uh, if you're coming off Scenic Drive, you're not going to be able to make a straight through movement to some fictitious development that we we don't know about right now. But just so you're aware, we we know that you know that there's things can change. Uh, and but we aren't trying to speculate too much about that either. And provide the solution that we think is best for 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 now. What we see now. Go ahead. Um, is it is it going to get worse? Like during construction season, is it going to be one lane traffic through town, or is it going to? Are you going to get the fall when you're doing projects for two years? Yeah. So um, back when this project was first talked about several years ago, MnDOT was always very, um, we wanted to, to alert people that during construction there will be um, a lot of impacts. And so if, if we allowed uh, traffic to, you know, remain on Highway 61 during construction, it would just lengthen the amount of time that it was impacted. So we are planning to um, to detour traffic, especially during the segment that um, ninth to fourth would be under construction. There just there's not any space, so there is a possibility of allowing for um, one lane of traffic, something like that, in you know the the other parts of the corridor where we do have more space, but. We're kind of telling everybody that to expect traffic to be under a detour so that we can construct it in as quick as um, quickly as possible, and we can keep this to a two-year construction project. There's city sewer and water under that section too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Good place. point. Good point. Yeah. So would that detour would that go down a residential road? So anytime there's a detour, we do need to have the, the local authority agree to it. Um, so we wouldn't put traffic, our mainline traffic, our Highway 61 traffic down any road that cannot, isn't designed for that type of loading. So we, we, don't, have a, we don't have any plan right now as far as what roadway we would use. We, um, that's a, a discussion to be had once we start, start into um, final design. But we, we typically get a, a detour agreement that allows MnDOT to use the roadway and compensates the, 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 local, the local road authority for that use. Any other questions? Go ahead, Derek. Yeah, just go, getting back to access, is it a true statement to say in general existing accesses will remain open and I know that there is some access to this property here uh, but I believe that is generally the practice that you've done if there's an existing access it's been maintained in the final plan. So some some businesses and properties have redundant accesses we try to work with the landowners to See if there's a business need for those redundant accesses. Like if, if they regularly get deliveries of large semis and, and that sort of thing and need two accesses, we, we don't want to hinder you know a business use. But where there are redundant accesses, we we do try and work with that that owner to see if that is needed and um, advocate for closing one of them that wouldn't be needed if possible. Because the, the more accesses we have on Highway 61, the more conflict points, the more opportunity for crashes. And so that's, you know, having safety as a, a big goal of this project and increasing safety. That would be one of our goals is to 
eliminate redundant accesses where we're, we can, but for the vast majority of, of the corridor, where there's an access, um, where a, a parcel has an access, we will not eliminate or landlock that, that business or resident. Well, knowing that we have to get through other portions of the meeting here fairly quickly, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much for the presentation and for answering our questions. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. <coughs> thank you. All right. We'll move on to administrative updates. I have nothing to close. Attorney updates. With all these engineering and all the <laughs> City Clerk and HR updates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few items that I would like to request be added to the agenda. Um, first, I'd like to request the addition of consent agenda item number 13, approving the application of Christina Schroeder for a license to conduct massage therapy at 621st Avenue. Also, the addition of consent agenda item number 14, authorizing the acting mayor and city clerk to execute and deliver a grant agreement with MnDOT for airport improvement, excluding land acquisition, and that's for the AWAS relocation project. And then also, um, I'd like to add communications item number two, an email from Kitty Mayo of the Lake County Press regarding an upcoming candidate forum. That's all I have for um, additions. Um, I wanted to let you know that the consideration of ordering the improvement for the 2324 Street Improvement Project will be on the agenda at the October 24th meeting because that's the time we're anticipating the proposal from Board and Maine for that work. Um, also wanted to let you know that the Board's and Commission's ordinance language does not become effective until October 12th. So the next meeting is when we can start appointing Commission members, committee, or Board and Commission members. Um, so, during between now and then, we're going to um, send each of the counselors copies of the applications that we have received, along with the listing of the boards and or the boards and commissions that we have openings on, um, just so that we can take action on that as quickly as possible and get those vacancies filled. Um, lastly, I've been working on uh, codification um, with the codifiers, um, just bringing. The most recently adopted ordinances since we've done the last publication up to date and, uh, and fitting that into the ordinance. That includes the, um, the zoning code and the code, code and so it's quite, a, quite a, a process, but I've gotten through that. Um, we can expect approval of that at our next meeting, or well, that's the first reading of the ordinance approving that. Um, and we would we need to schedule meetings of the Waterfront Committee and the Table Table TV Commission. So if you guys want to pick us some dates for that and give me that information as soon as possible, we get to work on those. Things. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, finance director updates. Um, Patty um, mentioned the. Um, grant agreement for the AWAS. Um, that is for that um, additional envir FAA environmental study that the council approved at the last meeting, and that's the 7525 grant agreement for that part of the project. Um, and I just, we have a busy couple months. We have the 2023 budget that we're going to work on finalizing. And then we also have the final assessment hearing for the street project for 21 and 22, but also for the 22 sidewalk project that will be coming up um, in um, probably November. And then we'll be, Public Works is working on the 2023 sidewalk um, project also. So hopefully they'll be presenting that um, sometime soon in the next couple of months. And that's all I have. Thank you. Public access coordinator updates. Uh, I would like to postpone for two weeks, consideration of time, and I'm quite not prepared. Sure. City engineer updates. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as you know, the, the big event for tonight is the public hearing presentation that will be coming up the next meeting, so I won't talk any about that here. Uh, the only action item I have for you on the agenda tonight is consent agenda number six. 
which is a most recent invoice for construction testing on the 2021-2022 street project. Pretty much covers all the construction testing from this season. Um, that's on your agenda. The amount is $5,891.25, and it's running under budget. So that's the only... Uh, other than that, um, there is communication in your memo, or excuse me, in your packet of our monthly memo, updating you with the status of all the projects. In the interest of time, you know, if you've got specific questions, I'll try and answer. Otherwise, uh, the update should speak for itself. Does anybody have any questions for Phil? No? Okay. Thanks, Joe. Welcome. <coughs> excuse me. Are there any other agenda questions or additions? Yeah, I've got a question regarding the library basement. Uh, it says the job is complete, but from what I see, there isn't any vegetation whatsoever there. Uh, there is some matting down, but that was actually donated by the SWCD. Uh, I'd just like to make sure that there's plans to revegetate that area rather than just let it turn into a uh, invasive species habitat. Go ahead, yeah, I know that the library director is working with um, a couple of different people to um, yeah make it much more accessible. I believe in from here. Okay. If there's nothing else, I'll look for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We're adjourning this meeting. Thank you.